and welcome back in the previous video you saw that we um, got our supercharger installed along with the accessory belt uh, the discharge line for it uh, replumbed in our purge uh, solenoid line uh, as well as our fuel line we went ahead and got that clipped back in off camera and redid our two vacuum lines one that goes to our gauge in the inside and the other vacuum line that goes to our purge solenoid down below so we've got all that back in. What I'm gonna focus on next is just getting the spark plugs reinstalled and that way we can install coil packs. And um, if you remember, there's the ones we took out of the motor. They're perfectly fine, nothing wrong with them. Uh, but I was able to find a pretty good deal on new NGK plugs. And yeah, it's a bit of an expense that we didn't need to do, but I went ahead and did it anyway. I wanna keep the original plugs we took out of the engine as spares and go ahead and just put these new plugs in. Now there is a torque specification on NGK's website for these plugs. But as you take these plugs out of the box, on the back of them, basically they show you threading it in by hand until it seats and then going another half to two thirds of a turn. Let me back that up for you. Once it meets. And that's the way I originally put these plugs in was that I, um, I usually thread them in by hand or thread them in a little bit and, and just kind of tighten them down until they get snug, until that crush washer meets. Uh, and then I go, once it makes contact with cylinder head, like it said here, about another half to two thirds of a turn from there. And I found that be uh, to be sufficient. Uh, again, that's what NGK recommends, you know, per their instruction. There is, there is also a torque specification that you can get for their plugs if you go to their website and just plug in the part number. So this is the part number we're dealing with here, uh, which is LFR6AIX-11 or 6619. This is what they refer to as, for at least this truck, one range or one step colder than the uh, plugs called for. The plugs that are the call for from the factory are LFR5 AIX-11. We went with a six uh, to do one range colder per Pro Charger specifications. This uh, plug number uh, was actually given to me by the speed shop that sold me the Pro Charger kit. So again, this and uh, all they do, all they do is modifications and high performance vehicles. So if they're recommending that that's the uh, heat range that we should be going with then that's the heat range I'm going to go with um, these plugs are iridium tipped meaning that uh, when we get this one open here they do come with a cardboard spacer which protects the top of the spark plug from getting damaged in shipment now because there is a itty bitty 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 tiny piece of material on that electrode i'm not going to gap these uh, i don't want to damage that surface or pop that piece of material off of what you see on that little top of that electrode there i'm going to take them as is put them in the engine and get them tight uh, even per ngk you know again towards the back of the package they explicitly warn you uh, about making sure that you don't gap these at least the way it shows in the picture because you can damage that material and i know you you can take a uh, uh, a gap checker to these and check that gap but generally from my understanding these come pretty well gapped to what they need to be from the factory so we're going to go ahead and get these plugs installed and then once we get them in uh, i'll bring you back and we'll start putting the coil packs in. But just to re uh, reiterate, what I'm going to do is I'm going to thread these plugs in until they seat up, until that crush washer seats up against the head. And then I'm going to go either another one half to two thirds of a turn after that. Uh, I'm not going to go, you know, no need to put, you know, full strength or full ugga dug uggas into to tightening plugs. You don't want to over tighten them. And you certainly don't want to strip out a uh, plug out of a cylinder head. That would make for a very bad day. Um, this was what I use here. Again, I uh, discovered this off of watching Boosted Motorsports' channel. 
I had a link to, to the uh, Amazon listing for this on the disassembly. I will find that link and put that into the description again as well. And you'll notice this is just a 3 8 socket adapter. But the nice thing is it's got that swivel built into the end of it, which on these Hemis comes in extremely handy for getting back there in those back corners up against that firewall. Uh, comes in real handy to be able to kind of jiggle this in place and be able to to use this socket. I'm going to go ahead and start on that. And like I said, I'll bring you back when it's done. Thank you much. Bye. So I want to bring you back and let you know we got our first eight plugs installed. Yes, I said first eight, the eight on the passenger side. Now we're going to do the eight on the driver's side. And you may be asking yourself a question if you don't know this already. Why is there 16 spark plugs in an eight cylinder motor? Well, as Scott Rods would say, and I agree, Hemi. Uh, <laughs> so it's not only that, but it's uh, they also do it like a lot of engines do, uh, not just the Hemis, but a lot of them will have double spark plugs on there to uh, provide a more clean uh, and all-encompassing burn. But basically trying to utilize or more completely utilize that air fuel mixture that enters those cylinders by firing two spark plugs uh, located kind of on opposite ends of the combustion chamber rather than just one in the center and it's pretty common practice a lot of them do it but you know just be mindful that if you're going to be doing this job on a hemi uh you need 16 spark plugs uh I had to modify my little spark plug adapter a little bit because the, uh, the little rubber isolator, and this is this is kind of common for these, uh, the little rubber isolator kept grabbing a hold of the spark plug tight enough to where you'd pull the extension out and the extension would come out uh, and leave the adapter behind on the plug. So what I ended up doing was just kind of pulling that little rubber insert out and just grabbing a little piece of blue shop cloth dropping it down in there and seating the plug. So it kind of looks something like, let me just grab an old piece here. So it kind of looks something like that. And then dropping the spark plug in there. And much like doing this to hold a bolt in place, it will it does a good enough job to hold that spark plug in there. So you can lower it down inside the uh, spark plug bore, get it tight, but then it's got a loose enough grip that when you pull this out, generally the paper, and the uh, spark plug adapter come with it. Now, obviously, if it leaves the paper behind, you can just reach down in there. I, I had one where it left a paper behind. I was able just to reach down in there because it's it's pretty high up within the spark plug bore at that point, just to reach down in there and grab a corner of the paper and pull it out. But generally, it comes out kind of like that, stuffed down inside the socket. And like I said, it, it did a, it's doing a little bit, uh, it's doing a lot better job than the rubber insert that was in there, which kept wanting to stick. But the socket in and of itself, like I said, I still like it because it's got that swivel on the very end of it. So it makes it excellent for getting in that rear place. So we're going to continue on. We're going to get uh, the next eight spark plugs in on the driver's side. Uh, and also one thing to mention, when you're putting these in, these in particular, I know a lot of spark plugs do this. I can't say this. I can't say that they all do it, but this spark plug in general has a crush washer on it. And by that, I mean, it'll make contact with the cylinder head and it'll tighten. And all of a sudden it'll feel like it's stripping because you're crushing that crush washer in place and then it'll start to tighten up again. So, you know, be mindful of that, you know, be mindful a that you, you don't over torque these, but B that when you're tightening these, it may feel like it gets tight. And all of a sudden loosens up and you may think, oh, no, I just I just did something bad. I, I potentially stripped it out. And what it is, that crush washer is just flattening out. And then usually within the next quarter turn or so, you'll feel it start to tighten up. Again, just be mindful of it. Go slow. Take your time. You know, it's not something you need to rush through unless you're changing the spark plugs out on the side of the road. You need to get the hell out the way. Uh, and, you know, things happen. But uh, I'll continue on, like I said, and uh, we'll get the driver's side of these plugs in place, and then uh, we'll bring it back and put our coil packs in. Talk to you in a bit. Bye. And welcome back. 
So we're down to our last spark plug on our driver's side to install, and I figured I might show you this. You, you've probably seen this trick before, but what I was referring to earlier, a little bit of blue shop towel. There's our spark plug socket. If you remember, we took the insulator out of it, the little rubber insulator out, because it was getting stuck to the plug, and, you know, those deep wells, uh, we couldn't get our spark plug socket out. So I took a little piece of shop towel, put it over there the socket. What I'm looking to do is when I put it down in there, you see how it'll tear off the excess. You see how it'll seat. It'll grab a hold of the plug, but it's still fairly loose. But it's tight enough that you can get that down in there without it falling out of the socket, you know, and maybe slam it against this electrode here at the end and potentially damaging it. So when you're done, you should put, be able to pull your socket out, and generally the, the towel will stay stuck in here. Now, on a couple of mine, it didn't. But like I said, generally that towel will stay right at the top of the plug and you can just reach down in there with your fingers and kind of poke it out. Or if you got like a, just a long pair of needle nose or one of those um, uh, plunger driven like three, three claw apparatuses, we'll, we'll, we'll pull it out. But again, just wanted to show you that, that that's, again, you can see it'll, it'll hold it in there well enough to you can get it in there and get it tight and then just retrieve it without the socket getting stuck to the plug and every time you pull your extension out your socket gets left behind but i want to show you that real quick okay so i'm going to go ahead and get this installed and we'll bring you back thank you much and we'll come back so we're just getting our coil packs prepped to go back on and i've treated each one of them with a little bit of dielectric grease down inside the boots as you can see here there we go see that so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get these installed uh, it's not too shabby you're not missing much I'm just gonna finish peeling the rest of our protective tape off where we painted our valve covers go ahead and get these bolted in place and then we'll get the electrical hooked up for the coil packs and then finally the electrical hooked up for the fuel injectors and if you remember and you can see from the tags there that when we disconnected everything we did go through and you know label which which plug went to which coil pack, although on this engine it, it may not be completely necessary to do that because the wiring coming off of that wiring harness is pretty short and it actually keeps it from being able to reach over far enough to plug into uh, another pack and or fuel injector, but still it's, it's, you know, it's not a bad thing to do uh, regardless. Uh, but with that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and get these installed and uh, I'll bring you back. Thank you much. And welcome back. As you can see, we've got our coil packs installed, both sides of our engine. I have to admit that after getting the coil packs installed, um, the sets off those uh, orange and those valve covers pretty nicely. Uh, we went ahead and uh, hooked up our uh, map sensor uh, in the very, very rear uh, corner of the intake manifold. So just as you probably saw in the uninstalled video, we went ahead and uh, reinstalled that and uh, Pro Charger does give you a different map sensor to run rather than factory because the factory one for this motor uh, won't read positive pressure from my understanding. So you need one that does and that map sensor is out of an SRT8 if I remember correctly. And they just give you a little billet machined adapter uh, to install it into and plug it into the factory and plus an adapter wiring pigtail and that allows you to plug it into the factory harness went ahead and uh, reattached our uh, fuel sensor for the inside of the uh, the cabin and again as you saw that's just a piece of stainless steel braided line uh, that comes off of the T and the fuel rail there uh, so that's been done. That's been done. Uh, coil packs, like I said, on both sides of the vehicle. At this point, uh, what I will do is go ahead and um, start to work on the getting the exhaust rebolted underneath. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a couple pictures of that, but I probably won't go too much in depth because it's literally just bolting the uh, collectors back up to the exhaust manifolds and then putting the exhaust. Uh, plumbing back together that we had to take apart in order to get that bolt out that just uh, that we posted about in a in a previous video that got dropped down that driver's side 
Uh, this line, since it's braided stainless steel, in case you're wondering, it's it's not going to lay on top of the uh, intake that you see it here because braided stainless steel line would eventually chew right through that. Uh, that'll actually rest on top of the engine cover. So when we put the engine cover on, we're just mindful that you know we put this on top of the engine cover uh, before we uh, uh, close everything up. Okay, so we've got that. We've got that. All that's good. That's going behind there. All right, perfect. Okay, so we're going to continue to, um, like I said, we're going to go down below. Uh, we're going to get the, uh, go ahead and start working on getting the exhaust uh, rehung. And the exhaust um, hangers, to show them to you here. Uh, let's see, I got one on the back. Yeah, so these rubber isolators, uh, you can you can do the same trick with these because again, rubber loves silicone. You can do the same trick we did when we put the radiator hoses on. You can throw a little bit of that uh, silicone paste inside of these holes here, and they'll slide right onto the hangers and uh, make it a much much uh, easier job to to deal with. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, crack on that, and uh, once we get that done. Uh, I'll bring you back for the uh, next update, but as you can see, we're starting to run out of parts and hardware, and we're getting there um, inch by inch, but I'll bring you back. Thank you much. Okay, just a quick update. We're getting the exhaust reattached to the exhaust manifolds. So you're, you're seeing the back of the white pipe here, and uh, what the white pipe is, it also serves as your catalytic converter, so it's one big, giant, expensive piece if you ever have to replace your cats. I, I guess unless you can take it to a muffler shop that can, you know, cut out the old cats and maybe weld in new ones. But if you order them from GM, you end up getting this, I'm sorry, not GM, but Chrysler, you end up getting this entire white pipe with the two cats attached to it. So... We've got the front loosely bolted to the collectors, just kind of holding that where it needs to go. And you can see the jack stand we've got supporting it. So we've got the uh, Y pipe here that goes into this center section. So we're going to leave the collectors loose until we get the entire exhaust hung. And before we tighten anything, then we'll tighten from the front collectors back. And I'll, I'll bring you back and show you what we did up front because as, as we spoke about before, we're not using Chrysler's hardware. We just went out and got some stainless steel uh, hardware to replace what bolts up to the exhaust manifolds. But again, that's just a quick update. Bring you back in a bit. Thank you much. Bye. So I just wanted to show what we were talking about earlier. I'm going to do this for all the exhaust fittings, uh, whether you probably should do this or not. I'm going to do this in case we have to take this thing apart again, considering how much of a pain it was to get this exhaust system to separate. Uh, since this piece here, this flange, fits into the next piece, we've coated the outside of where this is going to seat with some anti-seize. And also, like we spoke about before, where these rubber hangers attach onto these body pins. You can see that we've just kind of coated these pins uh, with some silicone paste. So it should get those rubber hangers to slide on uh, pretty easily. And once again, just so you see that, that's what we're using for silicone paste. Uh, and that's what I'm using for anti-seize. Bring it back in a bit. And welcome back. So as you can see, we've got our exhaust in. Um, at this point, and this is just uh, showing some of the, you know, non-OEM hardware. Again, these are just stainless steel hardware uh, from the local uh, parts store here. Uh, so, I, again, elected to go with these because the ones that were on there were, were so rusted and shot that, uh, you know, they were, they were a bear to get off. I, I didn't want to put them back on. Besides, I went with uh, stainless steel here and plenty of anti-seize. Uh, just to keep these from rusting up again in the future. But we've got our exhaust back in. We've got all our oxygen sensors replaced. And I'm going to get up shine some light on here. And you've got one oxygen sensor here. 
on the driver's side, which plugs into there. Hopefully you can see that connector. Uh, the other one for the driver's side is right here. Uh, if we follow the crossover pipe, it's actually back here. The two here on the passenger side, hopefully you can see that. One connector there comes out of the cat. And the other connector, which is pre-cat, is kind of up there on the top of the transmission, but, but you can reach it. But the one that is the bear. And why they put it here, I have no idea. They should have extended the connector on the harness, in my opinion, and kind of brought it out to the side of this transfer case. But this one right here, which is your driver's side cat, and the oxygen sensor, as you can see there, coming out of that, actually routes on top of the transfer case. So right here where you see the factory uh, part sticker, you kind of have to reach up into this area here, and there's a little valley in the top center where that connector is sitting. You can't see it. You have to do it by feel. What you basically have to do is line that connector up, and it'll slide in place and then click. It is a bear uh, to get to. Again, why they put that connector in the top center, I have no idea. They should have extended that wiring harness down and maybe, you know, found some way of attached it to the side of this transfer case, you know, and saved everybody a bunch of grief. Uh, but it is in. Uh, our exhaust is back in again, like I said, at this point. You can see our aftermarket muffler, which is a MagnaFlow muffler. We took the big factory muffler off. Uh, Probably about uh, two and a half years ago at this point. Uh, so it is done. It is in. It was a bear of a fight. Uh, I had two connections that I had to go out and get a pipe extender. Because uh, one thing that Chrysler does, at least on this model, is that all these exhaust fittings are slip fit. Uh, and what happened on mine was that on this one here and on the one down there that exits the muffler and goes into the resonator in the back the clamps uh crimped down on it so yeah we were able to get the exhaust uninstalled uh deinstalled but getting it back on the existing openings were scrunched down too far uh to be able to get the pipes to join back or slip fit back into each other so we can tighten our clamps so I'm going to show you the tool that I had to go out to Harbor Freight and get. You know, I had to forgive the camera work because I had to crawl out from underneath this truck. Uh, let's see here. Here it is right here. Do I still have it laying over there? Nope. Let's see if we put it back in the box. Uh, the standard tool that you can get, which a lot of the auto parts store has, which is actually this one here because I bought it thinking it was big enough and I mismeasured. This one goes to three and a half inches. Does not work on this 2500. It does not flare out big enough. We had to step up to the big boy kit that you see here. This one has fittings that will go up all the way to four uh, and a half inches. And it's actually meant to be used uh, with an impact gun. I did find out that uh, we were able to do that uh, without an impact gun and what I'm there it is right there uh, So the way this kit works depending on which one you need um, Sometimes you can use Just to show you here This is one of the inner sleeves that come with this tool the black inner sleeve here. You see with the bands This is the other sleeve which as you can see fits in the center of some of these adapters but for the larger ones, you have to change out to the larger sleeve. So you basically, you back this, um, show you here real quick. Well, probably not real quick, but you, get it. you see that forcing kind of cone at the end of this here. Again, forgive the camera work. I need both hands here to get this unthreaded. There we go. Okay. So this, again, this assembly is meant for the 
bigger ones that you see there and to take it a step further for these huge for this huge guy here then some of these as you can see here uh, you take one of these smaller ones we grab the right one here and you can see it fits inside of it and then you take your internal cert and then you put your 14 screw back on and it basically just you know expands all three levels out so what we needed to do uh, to get this exhaust get those this exhaust um, expanded out to fit was this collar right here and this was the three and a half to um, three and seven eighths collar if I remember correctly so we were able to get this collar in there uh, and just use a half inch um, oops, sorry that's why that's not fitting that one goes there that one there that one there and um, that one there uh, so we were able to use a, just a standard half inch ratchet on that bolt we didn't need anything as big as an impact because we j literally just had to push out um, that opening a little bit and then we we're able to get our two uh, areas where the exhaust pipe slip fit uh, slip fit together which again was the exit of the muffler going into the resonator in the back was one of the uh, slip fit connections we had an issue with and the other one was coming off the Y pipe where it goes into the center pipe was also uh, an issue but uh, again this kit made short work of it and it's just a Harbor Freight kit and uh, that's the name and the part number there and I want to say I think this is about like 140 bucks so it was a little pricey but it's what we needed it saved the day it allowed us to get our exhaust installed and uh, with that I'm going to cut this one uh, as a video at this point uh, I will um, I'll bring you back and the final video in this series is going to be um, and matter of fact, I, I won't, I won't, let me do one more thing. I'll, I'll cut the video at this point, but I'll add to it and then we will do the shroud install and the fan and the upper radiator hose, and then we'll call it a video and then a little.
here and install the intake uh, tube, you'll you'll see what I mean. The intake tube has that filter that you see down here at the bottom that plugs onto it. But what I want to show you, just like when we removed it for that electrical fan, again it sits down in place and gets held in by those lock tabs. But just like when we removed it, I just replaced that metal clip that you see there. So the bigger part of the clip is on that side of the fan. And as you can see, it just kind of bites into this little, that little ridge right there. Okay, so with that being done, uh, one thing I will more than likely do next because it's a it's a bit easier to do it this way is that uh, we'll see about getting this top uh, fan shroud back in uh, before we put the um, uh, clutch fan in. It's a bit easier to get this fan shroud in and out without that uh, clutch fan in place. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. I'll go grab the fan shroud and then I'll bring you back. Okay, so after looking at this for a little bit, um, I'm actually going to go ahead and put that clutch fan on first because we'd have better access to getting to it and tightening that fast fastener before we put the fan shroud in. Uh, since we're only dealing with half of the fan shroud, it makes it a bit easier. So just like when we removed that shroud, uh, that clutch fan or viscous fan uh, it was, it's a reverse thread so to take it off we had to act like we were tightening it uh, so it should means in order to install it that we have to act like we're loosening it so counterclockwise uh, should allow us to spin that on there and then we'll get it uh, we'll get it tightened up but let me go ahead and get this uh, threaded in place and you can see sorry I want to point that out I did coat those threads in anti-seize as I've done before because uh, the very first time we took that off to put the supercharger on many years ago, of course, it was straight from the factory. And that was a literal bear uh, to get off because it, it had kind of a little bit corroded in place. And again, that's just a little bit of copper anti-seize. So I'm going to go ahead and get that threaded on. And then I'll bring you back. One moment. See, it? just to confirm. Yes, uh, so when you're putting this one on, or at least this particular fan uh again reverse thread so act like you're gonna you know counterclockwise and it'll thread on and i think i showed this before but this is just a fan clutch removal tool that you can get at any auto parts store uh this particular dodge uh just to show you here uses the 36 millimeter side of this tool uh, and it will accommodate, it's got uh, cutouts in it or square holes in it to accommodate a half inch ratchet or breaker bar. And generally on these, what I do is I normally don't go too terribly tight with these. Um, hopefully, hopefully I can get you to see this, but if you watch the water pump pulley, generally once it starts to move the belt, and the accessories with it and hopefully you can see that water pump pulley move a little bit that's when I generally stop um, I've done that before and it's been fine doing that you know I don't want to go too terribly tight with that because in the event that we have to take that off again I just don't want it to be too much of a bear and I haven't had problems uh, again I've done it before and having problems with it uh, coming loose or anything of that nature so let's go ahead and get the uh, upper part of the radiator shroud in here next. And then we can also get our uh, intake pipe for our supercharger in once that's in place. Okay, one moment. I'm sorry, real quick, forgot to mention this. On this particular fan, you're going to notice just because of the way they've got this, uh, this fan built and I guess the way what they had to do for airflow and, and balancing, is that if you rotate this fan, you're going to notice that on some of these spaces between fins is bigger than others. And what I've noticed is this one right here in particular, 
you've got a nice big wide gap, uh, which makes it very nice for being able to get behind here where the fastener is uh, for this fan clutch. So if you got one of these, you know, and you're you're having trouble getting behind here, getting behind here with your hand, like right here, it would be a little bit problematic because you don't have as much room. You know, rotate the fan in your case and see if that's also the, the case as well. Because, uh, again, you can see I got a lot more room between the fins and I can actually get in there and work. So I just wanted to show you that little, that little tidbit. I'm going to go grab this upper shroud and I'll bring you back. And welcome back. So looking over things a little bit, uh, a little bit more on the pieces we had left. One was the upper radiator hose, uh, and with the fan shroud in, it would make it kind of difficult to get to that clamp that you see there. So I went ahead and installed that because with the shroud in here, it's going to stick out to you know a little bit past this fan, and it kind of blocks access to this clamp. Uh, so you may want to do that. You may want to go ahead and just. Uh, put that upper radiator hose on and uh, what I'm feeling for right now is just to make sure that uh, that went on all the way and it did There's a little stop right here uh, hopefully you can see that in the pipe there because it pushes on that far till it hits that stop and I'm reusing the upper radiator hose in this case I know in a, in a lot of this we replaced hoses but that hose was rel that that hose is relatively new, um, is is old as the supercharger is because we, we did replace it when we put the supercharger in. So I'm gonna have it go ahead and reuse it. It seems nice and secure and snug. It's not gonna go anywhere. But before you put the shroud in, it's a lot easier to get to that clamp um, without the shroud in place. So I'm just gonna go ahead and push this out of the way. Go ahead and get the shroud in here, and then I'll bring you back. Thank you much. So you can see we've got our upper part of our shroud in place along with our coolant hose. And in this particular case, the upper part of the shroud serves as a supporting mount for the upper radiator hose. And one of the things that ProCharger has, us, has you do is that this hose is actually an inch longer. Uh, but if you left the factory length on it, it would hit into the supercharger on this side so what they have you do is actually shorten this hose by an inch uh, and then attach it so what i'm going to do is make sure that that bit all the way around and it did okay good so it's clamps in the right spot it's behind the little nub so that's good so what we're going to work on next is getting this uh uh air intake spout uh, reinstalled and you can kind of see we've also had to modify the radiator shroud to kind of account for that so we cut out a little hole here to give it some extra room for the elbow that's on the bend of that supercharger to to fit in place so i'm going to go grab that piece and then i'll bring you back thank you so just to show you here we've got our uh, our intake tube with our filter reattached and just as we sh uh, just as we saw with the uninstall This is a tight fit. I'm not gonna lie uh, again without that uh, Fan shroud at least in my opinion being modified and again Again, it's 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 not a dig. It's not a negative. It's not anything against pro charger. It's again just kind of manipulating and dealing with the space that that you've got and the other thing that you have to realize is that not all uh 2500s are built the same either there are slight differences in them even though they may be the same make and model but uh, you know I'm, I'm rambling at this point to show you that uh, our uh our air intake tube along with our filter is reinstalled and you can kind of just kind of see it crammed down in the corner there. Uh, now you may be looking at this wiring harness and saying, hey, that looks like it's pinched. It's it's not. There is free play in there between it and the between the fuse box here and the air intake tube. Now to be fair, Pro Charger wants you to unhook it from here and push it up underneath the fuse box so this doesn't get in the way. Um, I didn't want to do that. I just took some more wraps of electrical tape and wrapped it around this area just as extra support and extra insulation. I mean, like I said, it's been that way for three years and it's been fine. I didn't want to 
take this clamp this connector bundle off and push it underneath because there's nothing to attach it to which means it would just kind of sit there and dangle so that's why i did what i did uh and just to show you the underside the reason why i removed the lower half of the fan shroud is as we saw when we did the uninstall if you look up in there and see where that filter's positioned you can see it's resting on the um uh a little bit on the, the frame of the electrical fan here now don't worry it's not resting on the radiator uh the so as you can see if that lower part of this shroud was installed that would kind of interfere with the way that filter uh gets attached again it's just uh just an extremely tight fit uh as you can see uh, and again, like I said, it's been running this way for three years and I have, I've had zero issues uh, with cooling, even though the lower half of the shroud is not here. Uh, the, metal, the metal braided line that you see, what we were talking about earlier, which was the uh, oil drain tube or extension to the oil drain. Let's see if I can get you some light in here without blinding you. There we go. I normally, this is the power steering gearbox. They just happen to have this bracket here. I usually pick this line up to about here uh, and then I'll zip tie it. And you see by holding it here, it keeps it out of the way of any moving parts or rubbing, rubbing up against uh, any other hoses. So again, cause this is steel braided. So you definitely don't want this rubbing up against like a power steering line or something along that nature. Cause it, it it will eat through it in pretty much no time flat. Okay, with that being said, uh, what else do we have in our little checklist that we can take off? Uh, I'm going to put one more washer, as you can see, between their spacer and the body of the, uh, the truck to kind of pull that away from that oil cooler line, because if you remember, it was rubbing a bit. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and take care of that. And I'll, I'll bring you back and show you what it looks like. Thank you much. So as you want to show you the difference there, you should hopefully be able to see that now we've got a pretty good sized gap between that line and that intercooler versus what we had before. And you can kind of see there's like three stacked washers behind their aluminum spacer down there. Uh, we also played around with the uh, fitment of the upper brackets that hang the upper part of the intercooler. Uh, and was able to get it into uh, obviously a lot better position than what it was. So as long as this doesn't play with the fitment of the grill, which I don't believe that it will, um, then we'll leave it as is. But I may have to take one of those washers out. Uh, if it is, it'll still have a, a pretty good margin of clearance in there versus what it had before, which was nothing. And now also on the front of these, I want to. I had these uh, quarter-inch um, bolt uh, fender washers uh, and put it underneath the factory washer that came with it because you can see the smaller factory washer on top and these elongated holes in this intercooler. This this little small washer really wasn't big enough to grab this uh, mounting tab and the washers were kind of wanting to fold inward. So I had a, uh, I just happened to have a box of these you know, quarter inch by one and a quarter inch fender washers. And as you can see, you know, they, they worked out quite well just to add some uh, additional meat and grabbing capacity of this bolt on that mounting tab. Uh, so what we're gonna do next is we're gonna go ahead and get our air inlet tube reattached. And then there's a mass airflow sensor and a temperature sensor uh, that we need to reconnect uh, for that as well. So I'm going to go ahead and get that inlet tube and then uh, we'll get that on here and I'll bring you back. Thank you much. And welcome back. So you can see we've got our uh, coupling boot attached to our throttle body. It's just a silicone coupler that comes out to kind of like a, an elbow that then attaches to the output of the intercooler so we've got that in and they did provision in the kit uh, you remove the mass airflow sensor and the idle uh, in the um, inlet air temperature sensor out and they get placed into this 
piece of pipe that Pro Charger provides you for the kit. So you can see we got a mass airflow sensor and our uh, inlet air temperature sensor reattached. We've got all our clamps tightened down for our air. Uh, we got our grill readjusted. Uh, I think the only thing we have left to do, uh, which I won't capture on the camera because there's not really much to it, uh, is putting the little clip on the bottom. And actually, I'll, I'll, I'll show that to you. That'd be a little bit easier to show that to you than, uh, than not. We've got a couple things underneath the truck here. Forgive the camera work. That we still need the button up. It's going to be reinstalling our inspection plate and then putting that clip right back on those transmission lines uh, if you remember you see that one stud right there I'll point at it with the flashlight that's got that piece hanging off there is a clip that will snap down those transmission lines and it will push in place and hold that much like the wiring loom so we've got that clip and we've got our inspection plate to reinstall and that will be the I believe the bulk of the items um, at that point so I'm gonna go ahead and get these two items uh, installed and then I'll bring it back and we'll reevaluate if we're uh, missing anything at this point talk to you in a bit Bye. and welcome back you can see we've got our transmission inspection plate in and tightened and when you're putting your inspection plate back in just remember that you've got this extra arm that reaches over and bolts in uh, this it's a supporting bracket for your transmission lines uh, let me give you a little bit of light on that so you can see that a bit better so you can see that metal arm that comes off of that corner of that bolt uh, you can see that we've got our new clip in right here that just again it's an extra it's another support for the transmission lines it just if you remember the deinstall, there's just two lines clip into the bracket or plastic bracket. That bracket pushes up on that stud, and then the front part of it you just swing over and and clip in place. And uh, okay, so what we'll do next now that we have those two pieces in, we'll crawl out from underneath here. We'll take a look at the bed of the truck and uh, see what else we got. Talk to you in a bit. And welcome back. So as promised, this is what we've got left. So everybody, we've installed everything we need to install uh, to get this uh, truck to, uh, to test fire at this point. The items you see left are items that were replaced by newer parts. That was part of the old uh, hose for the EGR cooler, the old thermostat, obviously water pump, uh, the uh, coolant reservoir jug. Obviously, these aren't going to go back on. Uh, this is for the fender liner, which still needs to be installed, but the fender liner will be done after we verify that the truck starts and runs okay. Obviously, just like we saw earlier, the, the belt we replaced. So we're done on that aspect. Uh, these are items that go either in front of or on top of the radiator shroud right after we install the uh, front, uh, front grill cover uh, and, of course, the engine cover itself. So as far as the engine itself is concerned, everything that needs to be on it is on it. Everything that needs to be reinstalled has been reinstalled. Uh, we've gone through at least twice at this point and verified that we have all of our connectors plugged in. Uh, so all of our electrical that we disconnected has been reconnected. We charged our battery the other day that you saw in the previous video. We just need to get our battery reinstalled. Uh, and then update the ECU, uh, dump in some oil, and uh, we will be uh, pulling off that uh, that old uh, factory filter as well. Don't worry, I just I haven't done it yet. So we will we will change out that filter to a fresh filter, uh, dump in some fresh oil, get the ECU programmed, uh, and then uh, we'll work on getting this thing started for the first time. So I'm going to cut this video at this point because it's it's been long, it's been lengthy, don't worry. Don't worry, I don't want to leave you hanging. What I'm going to do at this point, so this will be the last of the rebuild, quote-unquote rebuild video of getting items installed. 
The next video you'll see is that we'll be putting fluids in the system at that point and then prepping this, uh, this vehicle for first start. So I'll definitely bring you along for that and I shall chat at you then. Thank you much. Bye.